So good afternoon. Yeah, lots of experience and uh, I have to say many scars on my back over the years with trying to implement this with, with large customers. But we're getting there because the technical things we can solve. So what I wanted to go through with you is first of all I want to set the scene a bit. You might have seen some of these slides in previous presentations. Sorry if that's the case. Then I'll just go through those quickly. And, and then really discuss and present how can you implement cloud service yourself? What is the step-by-step -step approach? And it's not about technology. It's, it's not about blue boxes in your data center. Although we like to see blue boxes in your data center, obviously. It's really the process to go through to define what type of services and so forth you want to deliver as a cloud service to your end users and so forth. And how you can work together as governmental agencies and get further efficiencies and benefits from cloud. So, was this slide shown already before today? Did anybody pay attention? Not, not shown before today? Well, this is the definition of cloud computing as it has been defined by the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is part of the US government. So if you're looking for a definition of cloud computing, look for this document. So, and what is all in there? So it's about on-demand self-service. It's about, about ubiquitous access through the network, through the internet, what have you. It's about sharing of resources to leverage those as efficient as possible. It's about being able to measure what is being consumed by different parties involved so that you have a basis for billing, if that's something you want to implement. It's about scaling up and scaling down. So those are the five main characteristics of a cloud infrastructure, of a cloud service. Then there are different models, whether it's infrastructure of a service, platform of a service, or software as a service, like for instance, um, uh, Salesforce.com and then there are different deployment models like a public cloud like an Amazon.com or Gmail private cloud within a company within a governmental institution a hybrid model leveraging the best of both there or community cloud where different parties work together and provide jointly cloud services to their end customers so you see a link in there that's the link where you will find the document with all the definitions about cloud. So what does cloud mean for the government? So a couple of major items, right? So it's about sharing resources from a centralized data center environment. It's about on demand, the access again, sharing operations, lowering the overall cost of delivering IT to your end users and scaling up, scaling down for rapid and automated provisioning. And that's where a lot of the technology comes into play. So why does everybody talk about cloud nowadays? Actually, it was even on the news last week in the Netherlands where I'm from. It wasn't very good, but it was even on the news. So apparently, they had nothing else to talk about. But there is a lot of interest for cloud. So why is that? Because there are many, many benefits for cloud. So whether it's for telcos, service providers, that can now in a more efficient way provide services and new services to their customers, which can be, for instance, large enterprises or public sector, or small businesses that can now get access to IT services that are as advanced as typically only enterprise customers could get access to. If you start a small business nowadays, you will not buy your own accounting package anymore. You will not install that on your own server anymore. You will just get a service through the cloud. In my country, nobody who starts a small business is still buying its own accounting software. That is just a thing of the past. So now they get access to these type of professional services. Many advantages for and benefits for the enterprise, like reducing complexity, reducing cost, being able to scale up, scale down, all that flexibility, and also many, many advantages for the public sector, specifically reaching out to all your citizens around there, sorry in the UK it's subjects by the way. So being able to reach out to them and have them engaged in the political process. I need to go online to be able to uh, put in my taxes. So my tax application is fully online. I have an ID from the government, I have to put it online and I get the bill in the, in, in, in the mail in about two weeks. I think that's one of the benefits, not a benefit for myself, but these type of processes have become so much more efficient if you can leverage that as a government. So collaboration between agencies, 
by working together, joining, re using resources, joint of resources, lowering your cost, very important, of course, in the current age of budget restrictions and budget cuts. And, and driving new economies of scale, again, to further lower those costs. So th good reasons why many, many persons are currently talking about and are very interested in the cloud. So yeah, and this is a, um, this is some research from Intel. So again, there is a document available where you can look it up. If you're looking for input into a business case to look at, to implement an infrastructure, cloud type of infrastructure in your own data center or environment. So this is some data back from, from Intel. And so it's about comparing current practice with the operating or the processes uh, within the cloud. And so provisioning a server, which took about, well, a week it says here, it can take up to two to three months to provision a server, going through the procurement process, understanding what's really required, and so forth, and so forth. First is having something available within one, two, or three hours. Uh, deployment cost, and so forth. Significant, significant savings there from a timing perspective and cost perspective between the traditional models where everything was, belt, was built as a one-off versus a cloud model where everything is being operated, sorry, automated and standardized. So already went through a number of the, of the benefits before. So flexibility of resource allocation, being able to scale up, scale down wherever it's required on very short notice. Being able to run your IT much more efficient, specifically when you start putting resources together between agencies, like for instance a G Cloud initiative in the UK. And having all parties involved being able to access those resources. So small communities, etc., that or municipalities that were not able to get access to those type of resources in the past will be able to leverage that moving forward. So everybody can play in this area. Benefits again, very similar to what I said before. Secure shared ICT resources and the secure part is very important, of course. If you start mixing and matching applications and workloads from different agencies on a shared platform, how can you make sure that users from other parts, from other agencies, cannot get access to your data? And that's where we have a lot of uh, experience working with the large service providers that are exactly delivering those type of services to their end customers. Uh, that quick agile provisioning and very and significant reduction in cost. Again, through all of the automation of the processes, but also through sharing and pooling of the resources. So where do governments or public sector see benefits when it comes to cloud implementations? So it's about sharing of information and collaboration between different agencies within a government or a country. Improved security, having improved control over the environment through standardization, through automation of the processes. Having better sustainable and better business continuity of the environment. Again, for all of, if, if you start automating processes, the risk of error is so much reduced. And then further items, having better control over the resources, having more transparency about what's happening in the, in the data centers. So this is some research, again, if you're building a case to implement or look at cloud services within your agency. So this is a case which is uh, from Microsoft. Again, there is a white paper. It's called The Economics of the Cloud. And it is comparing the cost of a private cloud, so implementing a cloud type of environment within a single agency or within a single company, versus having a similar scale cloud being provided through a cloud provider like an Amazon or a Telefonica or a France Telecom or a BT or what have you. And through all of the sharing of the investments of the processes that are being implemented and so forth, there is a major, major case to go to, to really look at cloud services and not start building it yourself. So I think that's also one of the reasons why we're having the G Cloud initiative in the UK, trying to pull all of the demands and requirements and resources from different agencies, and then coming up with a model where through doing that, through joining up, those IT services can be provided 
much more efficient than when each of the agencies would do it themselves. And many of these cloud services will be very, very similar anyway, right? So why build the same factory time, time, 10 times over instead of building one bigger one? And that's basically what, is, what a study is providing. So as already said, lots of interest in the cloud at the moment, definitely within the public sector. So all of these initiatives are going on in, within uh, several governments around the globe. So this is just some examples, Canada, US, Japan and Australia. Uh, nice example, and that came out last year. So the, uh, the municipality of Los Angeles, which obviously is a big one, put all of the 30,000 uh, civil servants on a Gmail cloud and significantly reducing cost. By the way, it's not the same one that we're using. So again, get a different offering from Google, which is more secure than the typical Gmail that we would get access to as a consumer. So I already mentioned G Cloud in the UK, which is a major initiative for the government. The US government, so they actually, they announced the CIO, I think it was two years ago, as part of the Obama administration, who have started a massive initiative to start developing and building cloud services and doing consolidation across agencies of all of the IT resources. There are a lot of documents available there, again on the internet, that you might want to have a look at. Like there is a 25 uh, action item plan that they put together to start defining and building cloud services. There are examples of RFQ and RFP documents. So if you want to get a head start, there is a lot of material out there from the US government that you might be able to reuse. So then really how to get started. So there are, there are all these great benefits from moving to the cloud. So why are, we not using, where are, why are we not all using the cloud yet, right? If there are all these great benefits. Because it's not so easy actually to implement and to set up as it might have seen in the previous presentation. But it's not about the technology often. It's more the things around it, the processes, the culture, the people working together between different agencies and so forth that make the things very hard. So how to get started and really start to get the benefits. So of course there are all these items that need to be balanced with respect to controlling costs, working together and so forth, reducing budgets while you want to invest, making sure that it's very secure, which is the number one concern. Global economy and so forth, there are many items at the moment that come into play which make it at one side, more difficult to invest and to move into cloud type, of, cloud type of infrastructures and services. At the other hand, additional reasons to say we really need to start changing things, sorry, start to change things how we've done them for many years and we need to start doing things dramatically different, leveraging cloud techn technologies and cloud services. So I already mentioned about security. Um, so this is a study from just two years ago and basically what it's showing is, has my IT infrastructure become more or less secure over the years? So this is more secure, this is less secure, and as you can see from 2006 and 2008, so more secure has decreased and less secure has increased. And of course if you start putting, starting opening up your IT infrastructure, make it accessible through the internet and what have you, then the security concerns start to increase. So how do you also address those type of items? Has anybody read this book? Silos, Politics and Turf Wars. So this is about all of those organizational obstacles, political fights, etc., that typically happen within organizations and which for large technology projects, in my experience, are the main reason why these fail. So the, the book doesn't provide the answers, but if you want to have some good evening reading, it's actually it's quite amusing, then, then I can recommend this book. At, at the same time, it does provide a good overview of those obstacles, and this is definitely something to keep in mind. So I just mentioned the CIO for the US government. So I think he declared last week that he's quitting his job because he's not getting any traction with all the US governmental institutions. And again, it's not about the politics, it's not about the two and a half billion budget they had, it's about all the organizational obstacles. 
because this is my data center. I don't want to merge it with others. I'm so concerned about my security. I've got three different email systems because I've got three different levels of security within my agency. I can't give that up, and so forth, and so forth. That's where the issues come in. Do you feel better now? Not sure if it helps, eh? So how do we help customers to move to the cloud? So we have a standard five-step approach, which is quite straightforward. So it's really starting with consolidating the resources you're having, standardizing what you're having. If it's not standardized, you can't build automation around it. Leverage virtualization. It helps you to make better use of the resources, the IT resources you have in your data center, across storage, across compute, across networking. And it also, it does have a positive impact on your operating costs because a number of activities that you need to do just become easier when it's virtualized. Unify your fabrics. Do that virtualization across all the layers. Have only one single network within your data center instead of having InfiniBand, TCP IP, fiber channel, and so forth, and so forth. Right? And that's what the industry is moving towards. Then the automation also becomes much more easy because there are fewer technologies that you need to start automating. So the automation layer, and that's just what the, what the previous presentation was about with all the tools that are currently available, like from BMC, from other vendors, uh, the Tidal tool that we have within our own portfolio now. So automating all of the standard processes to provision and so forth, and then start moving to cloud. And actually moving to cloud is not just automate, automated provisioning and automated management processes within your data center. It's about what service do I want to offer to my customers? What do they really need? At what price point? With which options? And so forth. So that's the service catalog that you need to build. It's a crucial part. And then when you have that established, then reach out to see whether you can also leverage the external cloud whenever you need to scale up all of a sudden, when you need extra resources. So that's, that's the approach that we're having. So just to go into a little bit more detail. So this is the service approach that we're taking our customers with. And sorry to say, most customers that start working on implementing cloud do not start this, do not follow this process. They start at the infrastructure. There is this virtualization there, so they want to implement it in the data center, and then they want to provide, put some automation on top to see how this works and so forth. Okay, but what are they really building? What are they building for? And then at, at some point in time, initiatives get stopped and they have to start all over again. So what we're currently doing in IT is what all, all major industries have gone through through the ages, right? From building one-offs, unique items, to having standardized, fully automated factories. That's basically what we're implementing here. So it's like the same in the car industry, and I just use that as an example, just because I like talking about cars, that's one reason, but I think it's also pretty clear. So when the car industry just got started, people, persons that were able to, to buy a car at the time, they were getting a chassis somewhere with wheels and an engine, they went to a coach manufacturer and said, okay, then I want to build this on top, etc. it should look that way, they got a quote for that, and then it got built on their behalf. And then they got the car six months later. Right? And Henry Ford significantly changed the industry because he came up with a model, a single model, which he believed would have the biggest impact on the market, which the wheels so far apart that you could use the standard roads in the US, which were just on the farmland, one color, and then a price which was like 25% of what a, what a car what cost previously. And that's exactly what we're going through in the IT industry as well. But before we start building a car, we need to understand what type of car we're going to build. Are we going to build a Volkswagen? Or are we going to build a Rolls Royce? Because if you're going to build a factory for a Volkswagen, it's going to look very, very different versus a factory for a Rolls Royce. And then what type of options am I going to provide? So if you don't have an understanding of what type of IT services you want to provide, with which options, at which cost, how can you build a factory for it? So that's why you need to get started. So it's really starting with the top part, service definition, the costing for those services, 
Understand what you already have in house, what you can leverage. When do you want to go to market or when do you want to start pro providing those services to your end customers? So from that, it's then about we're getting into the, a bit more into the technologies. So what type of processes, what type of infrastructures do we need to design and do we need to implement? What type of automation is required to deliver those services? And then having done high level architecture designs, process models and so forth, then we start doing a proof of concept with a number of straightforward services, putting it in production and then build and scale it out. That's the standard model to move into cloud services, but start with understanding what type of car am I going to build and sell to my end users. So then looking at the key components of a cloud architecture, I talked about the self-service catalog. So that is really where you provide access to your users, your developers, etc., where they can order a server, email, a bigger email box, uh, maybe a mobile phone as well, right? to really automate all of the provisioning processes um, within the IT environment. And then of course there are all the other aspects like the SLAs. You need to tie in with your CMDBs because you need to understand what's available in the pool. Who is using what? The orchestration tool to automate all of the processes underneath the service catalog. You need to have an understanding how are you going to bill out to your end users. The chargeback model, the pricing, the cost and so forth. How are you going to track all that? Which systems are you going to use for that? And then, of course, all the operational processes to support it. And, as in the car industry, right, you need to refresh your services. You will have new demands, you will have new technologies be coming out. So you need to have an active organization that is managing your service catalog to keep it up to date. And then underneath, of course, the result of the infrastructure, the storage, the compute, and the network. One recommendation, if you start building a service catalog, make sure you leverage one that can also tie into external service catalogs. Like for instance, if you need something rapidly and you can't deliver it yourselves within your own IT infrastructure, that through the service catalog, the user can order a virtual Windows server at amazon.com. And those technologies exist today. So that you're gonna really start integrating the internal cloud and the external cloud. If you don't have that, they will go outside anyway. There was some research recently between CIOs and application developers and the question was how much of your IT spend is out of your control and the CIOs thought no it's all under our control and the developer said well about 30% is out of the control of the CIO because they were just going straight to Amazon and ordering servers to do the development activities. So having gone through all of that with customers we then leverage our cloud reference architecture framework and, and then you really start to see what all comes into play and how complex this can be. And I must say some of the projects we're doing are far more complex than you would see within your own environment because some companies want to really automate each and every line in the firewall. But there is, so we have, but to help, we have this framework which includes the access layers on the, on the client side, etc. What do you need to do from a management perspective? All of the other items that come into play from a service delivery and service management perspective. Service catalog, other items that I just took you through. And then standard frameworks for how to set up the underlying infrastructures. And, and these are the type of projects that we deliver end to end at the moment around the world. So we got best practice designs and specifically best practice designs for virtual multi-tenant data centers. Because if you start pooling resources and data centers from different agencies, how can you make sure, again, that users from one agency do not get access to any resources that are being used for by users from another agency? So there we have best practice designs and frameworks which we're implementing at scale at the moment with the large service providers. So when you request a resource that everything is properly set up from a firewall perspective, load balancing perspective, VLAN perspective, across all of the layers. And I must say that portion is much more complex than booting up a virtual machine on a blade server. And, and that's, I would say, also where our differentiation, our skills come into play 
for all of those layers, especially on the networking side. So then working with our large accounts, it's, not, it's, it's about getting the first services ready and started, and then to build on top of those. So whereas it typically starts relatively straightforward with providing compute resources, click a button, there is a Linux server in a virtual machine, well, excellent. But then afterwards providing, for instance, a dev test environment or providing a database environment or providing a platform as a service which includes a portion of a web server, an application server and a database server to support a .NET or a G2E application. And then going into software as a service where actually you're using so software services that are being provided by third parties. And, and this is the type of roadmap that we built. Well, this is not really a roadmap, right? But the type of roadmap that we built with our customers, not only to help them getting started, but also what the end goal is going to look like. So I'm almost at the end of the session. So I just want to take you through a few services that we have more or less packaged available to our end users. So it's really helping to understand what cloud can do for my business. What type of architectures maximizes virtualization, speed of orchestration and so forth? How can I best design my architecture? And how can I then implement it on time, in budget, in my environment? So we have a number of services around it. So starting with a cloud strategy service to really help you define what type of services you want to provide to your end user community the service catalog around it, the costing around it, and so forth. Then going into design of the technology, which we're calling our planning and design service for the cloud, and then doing the, the actual implementation, which we call the cloud implementation services. So and this is an, um, an overview of a, a typical cloud engagement structure, as, as we are delivering for the very large uh, service providers uh, in, in Europe. And again, there, multi-tenancy in a secure way is so important because they want to support all these different customers from within a large shared environment that I'm, I'm really proud to say that we've been able to win and deliver most of the very large public cloud implementations in Europe, beating up the standard uh, parties that would typically be asked to deliver that. And why is that? Because we can do this across all of the layers. We can do the automation across all the layers. We understand what this means on the networking side. We understand what this means on the SAN side, and so forth, and so forth. So an engagement would look as follows. Of course, there's a lot of project and program management. Helping understand what you already have in, have, having in your data center. Characterizing the workload on your cloud infrastructure. Doing the operations design. So what type of processes? What are you all going to automate and what are those processes going to look like? And this is actually very, very extensive work. Then looking at things like the service catalog and so forth, the chargeback, doing the technology architecture and the security aspects around that. Also, if that is part of the requirements, looking at your facilities, whether your facilities are able to hosts and house such a, well, very virtualized and compressed environment with, with a large energy footprint with respect to kilowatts per square meter. And then really putting together the cloud, cloud, sorry, the cloud strategy, the cloud roadmap to help really help you move forward and also help you understand what the end goal is going to be. So I talked already about operations management. So the technology I can't say it's easy because there, is a, there are many, many aspects that come into play to really do cloud automation and provisioning and billing and service catalog end to end. But where it fails typically is in the operations and the management because it's a different way of thinking. It's not anymore the developers or the application owner coming to your people and saying, now I want to have, well, I want to host this application, so you need to provide me free servers and so much storage, and by the way, no, I don't want SUSE, I want Red Hat Linux to run it on. It is upfront having capacity available 
which is meeting most of the requirements of all the users, that when they come to you that it is available through the self-service portal, of course, that it can be available within a couple of hours. So it is about joined up capacity management across all of the resources, again, to make sure that all of the capacity is available when it is needed, that you start procuring new resources when you start somewhere hitting a, uh, a capacity issue before you're actually hitting it, right? So also through virtualization, through merging up all of the different aspects of a data center infrastructure across with, uh, with a unified fabric, with virtualization, across storage, compute, networking, operational processes start to change. Many of our customers, where we have implemented these type of infrastructures, then struggle to break down the silos that they were having within the IT organization where the server team doesn't really talk that much with the storage team and the network team doesn't talk with anybody at all anyway. And now all of a sudden they have to come up with this pre-provisioned, consolidated environment and it just needs to be up and running. That is a change in mindset and a change in organizational models. So again, that is, that is a learning that we have found through doing these type of implementations. So we've delivered, sorry, we have put together a number of services to help organizations go through that organizational change. So it is about assessing what type of procedures, organization, and so forth you currently have in place, doing a design for an optimized organizational model and process model to being able to manage an end-to-end -end virtualized and automated data center environment, and then of course implement it and we can also help actually with handhelding your staff for a couple of weeks or a couple of months until they fully grasp the new ideas and taken that on board and are ready to operate the environments themselves. So this is a, um, a short case study of a customer uh, where we have implemented the cloud, um, cloud infrastructure. So this is one actually from the public, public uh, sector. This is the IT organization for the Italian railroad but also they are an IT provider to the transport wider transportation sector in Italy. So they were providing hosting service in the traditional way. Customer coming to them, I want a server. Six months later, there's your server. And they wanted to move, and then you get a fixed bill month after month, and they wanted to move to automated provisioning, paper use, flexible charging models, and what have you. Also, they wanted to really start leveraging virtualization to deliver those services much more efficient as they had done today. So, so sorry, here is where the blue boxes come into play because there in the middle you see the whole list of all of the Cisco products. But basically, they com completely embarked on the, on the Cisco data center 3.0 architecture, which we implemented in the data center end-to-end, -end, including the orchestration and provisioning layer on top. So now they're in a position, and they're already doing that, to sell infrastructure as a service. If they would not have this capability, being actually a service provider to the transportation market in Italy, they would not have been able to win a number of interesting deals. So this has really helped them to increase their revenues significantly already within one year after the, the environment becoming available. At the same time, for leveraging the latest technologies, the virtualization, the resource pooling, and so forth, energy costs went down dramatically, cabling went down dramatically, converged fabric, and also the cost of provisioning new servers has decreased significantly. I must say, this is a little bit different number from what you've seen on the intel slide at the beginning, but different cases come up with different numbers that, that I have to say. So why Cisco for the, for the proven cloud? Sorry, Cisco for the public cloud. So yeah, we have a lot of experience in this area. We might not be the first one you think about to implement and design your public cloud to help you with designing your strategy for the cloud. But I would say our expertise across all of the layers that come into play is at this moment unmatched in the market. So we have a lot of expertise with very, very large implementations. Um, some of which you can now find in the, in, in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, Quadrant as a leader for, for cloud infrastructure providers. And as I said already, uh, most of the large uh, service providers in Europe are, are currently customers of Cisco for implementing exactly these type of infrastructures, multi-tenant secure environment, 
at scale. So these are just a few of the companies that uh, we're working with to help them design, build, implement, and deliver the cloud infrastructures and additional services as they're building on top of that infrastructure. And, and the list, this is just a few, the list, the list is growing and growing uh, by the month. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I'm always uh, very happy to talk about cars. So I hope you found it interesting. Any questions? Well, a bit early, I think, right? No questions? <laughs> <laughs>